Okay, so remember in the last lecture we were talking about soil and looking at soil profiles. <clears throat> so what I want you guys to remember here is that nutrients start out here and decomposition occurs, breaking down the organic matter that's in the O layer. And then those nutrients continue their trickling down trend lower and lower and lower. If you don't have good soil... Uh, organisms, fauna, worms and insects and things like that to make holes and tunnels through the soil, the nutrients can't get down deeper and deeper. The bigger your A layer, here's a big highlight, the bigger the A layer, the more productive your crop will be. So most of our food comes from the A layer. Let me circle that. Hopefully you're getting getting the hint. So that topsoil is really, really important when we talk about agriculture and trying to maximize yields and things like that. So what we want to start discussing now and looking at is the use and unfortunately the abuse of soil. So roughly, and this is a moving number, but roughly 12 and a half percent of the earth's land area is in agricultural production, some type of agriculture. Corn, beans, wheat, alfalfa, hay, rice, apples, peaches, etc. It's estimated four times as much land could actually be converted to agricultural use. So when we talk about a growing human population, Can we feed more people? Well, we need more farmland unless we're going to increase yields on the existing ground we have. But this idea, oh wow, we got, you know, we can till up and convert and turn 40 to 50% of the Earth's land into agriculture. It's a lot of land, but what environmental cost? Basically, eliminate all the forests, eliminate any leftover or remnant prairie, eliminate deciduous forests, temperate rainforests, eliminate coniferous forests, get rid of the tropical rainforests. That's the, the land we're talking about that could be converted, but it is not something even to remotely consider to say, well, let's just turn the land on earth all into farms, farms and cities, and nothing else. Biodiversity would be wiped out and we would destroy the ecosystem of our planet. So what we have to consider is what is the direct and indirect value of converting that land? So take a look at this aerial shot. The white lines there represent property lines. You have a farmer who lives here. There's the road going in, there's the house and the barns and the, the sheds for the equipment. And then this is tillable. So this area here, this section here, and then this section back here. This is their property that is under cultivation. Obviously, they're not tilling up the, or not at this point, planting where all the trees are at. So you go, okay, what would the direct value be of pulling out those trees, taking out the tree lines, getting rid of all the trees, so then you could run your agriculture across this entire area. So straight through here, it'd be so much easier for farming. If you knocked out all this, then you could easily go over and farm this way. Maybe you leave a little pocket of trees here or there, but the bigger you can expand this property into farm, the more revenue you can draw from that. So there is a direct value. How many bushels per acre are you going to get from that land that used to be in the woods? Depends on the woods. If it's flat, maybe you get good yield. But if it's creek bottoms and it's sloped, you may not get much and you may not safely be able to actually farm it. But let's also look at the indirect value. What are all those trees doing? Think about the soil erosion factor. Think about the cycling of nutrients. Think about the biodiversity. Those are all things we have to consider when we're having conversations about conversion of land into agricultural land. So as an environmental scientist, the idea is moving away from this conversion, 
moving it back towards native habitats, but it's a challenge because financials often dictate a lot of our decisions. And that person who owns that farm may say, I need to make more money to pay my taxes, to pay for health care, to send my kids to school. Can I make more off of the land I have? Maybe I need to have more tillable on my property. Can I get 10 more acres of tillable by removing those trees? That will equal this many dollars in a given year. Those are numbers we're going to talk about when we get further into farming because those are conversations you may have with people. Well, if I knock down the trees and till up that patch of prairie, how much will I make? How much are you gonna lose is also a question we need to answer or to propose and present is what is the cost of that conversion? The direct cost as well as the indirect cost. Okay, so now a big, big problem that is happening with conversion of land away from natural ecosystems into farm is erosion, not just from water, but from wind. So we get into areas where we have a lot of heavy wind, you lose your topsoil. It just blows away. Think about the Dust Bowl back in the 1930s. Water erosion is a major issue as well. So you look at this map, Illinois is very, very prone to losing soil because of water erosion. We get heavy spring rains, it rips through the fields, and it takes away how many millimeters of topsoil a year. So we can see this every day. You look at the water running off of a field and it looks like chocolate milk because it's got so much topsoil mixed into it. So that's a big issue. Maybe you leave some of your woods in place because they act as a buffer against the wind. They slow the water flow down to decrease the erosion of topsoil off of your farm. Save your topsoil, less fertilizer. Saves you money. So those are all the things we need to educate people about. And a lot of people in the agricultural world are learning those things. They're a lot of them are already educated about it, but those are things that need to be presented during conversations about agriculture and what we can do to be sustainable with agriculture. So, all right, now soil loss. About 20 metric tons of soil per hectare. Hectare is a little bit over three acres. Per year is washed away and lost. Uh, one way, is through what's called sheet erosion, where a very, very thin layer, oh, actually spell it, thin layer of, oh, I can't spell, sorry guys. A thin layer of surface soils lost. So you get a heavy rain, it washes, one or two millimeters of soil off the top of your field. That's what we call sheet erosion. So it, it, it's this big section of field that loses topsoil. Um, real erosion is when you get larger amounts of water running off or more water collecting into a, like a depression, a low line area. And you get these, what they call small rivulets of running water that will cut small channels. So, I think I spelled rivulets. There we go. Small rivulets, small, small little rivers, these tiny little, ri not really a river, tiny little strips of water collecting that cut small channels. So the picture here on the left, this is of sheet erosion. So up here where you have this wide stretch where water is rushing across it or flowing across it, and then it starts cutting little channels. There's a channel here, there's another channel over here. Those would be the real erosion that often is a result of sheet erosion. So sheet often becomes real erosion. Then if real erosion continues, you get into into uh, gully erosion where you have larger channels of 
water erosion. So the small channel has now become a much bigger channel and you're losing even more. So the real erosion here progresses over time into gully erosion. So now this little channel that was about 16, 18, 20 inches wide has now turned into a two to three foot opening that's maybe two to three feet deep. So now you're into gullies. The gullies, depending on where it's at, if it's along the edge of the stream or further inlet in the middle of your field, etc., can continue to build up and erode. And then we get into stream bank erosion. All right, so stream bank erosion, the erosion of the banks of hills. So the gully keeps eroding this, and that bank collapses, and then the gully gets bigger. If we're talking about an actively flowing stream or river, the sides of it just keep eroding out because of the amount of water. So getting the idea with this sheet erosion, Let's get that. Sheet erosion often leads to rill. Rill erosion leads to gully. Gully erosion can lead into bank erosion if it continues to enlarge. So the goal is, can we stop it? Can we stop sheet erosion before it becomes rill? If it turned into rill, can we stop it before you get gully? Once you're into gully, it's difficult. And we'll talk about some of this. You know, can you do something in here to slow down the water flow? Can you plant some kind of vegetation here to help with preventing further damage? Really, most of this is done by going up the side of the bank and establishing a buffer of vegetation to slow the water flow coming in. And then once the water is in the gully, slowing the flow of water as it goes through the gully. But doing this type of stuff requires losing crop ground. So that's where you get in that challenge of, well, I don't want to give up crop ground to prevent the erosion, but if I keep eroding my field edges, I am losing my crop ground. So it's a, it's a no-win situation. So it has to be done. It's not a fun thing because you lose financial acreage, but in the long run, it's the ideal thing for your farm productivity. Um, the third picture is of wind erosion and areas becoming deserts. So let's just jump to this one. Uh, you get a dry climate, you get flat land, and you get some heavy, heavy, harsh winds, and it just wipes your topsoil off, just rips it off, especially if you've had dry conditions and you don't have good vegetation to hold the topsoil or to break the wind then you move towards desertification. So with desertification, it's the conversion of productive land into deserts. Not good at all. Because now, once it's become a desert, it's not going back. You're not gonna reclaim that, or it won't go back quickly it will take generations to reclaim that land from the desert there's some incredible efforts being done in africa and different countries in africa and the middle east where they're planting trees they're trying to reforest areas to stop desertification and over generations it may actually reclaim that land from the desert and make it more productive if it can be sustained, that's the challenge. So, all right, now, something else to mention when we talk about soil erosion and water and issues is irrigation. You know, we do some irrigation in Illinois, depending on where you're at. Good, bad, depends on how much irrigation. Sometimes we actually waterlog and flood our fields. So water logging is an overabundance of watering on an agricultural field. So we'll talk more about this in the next lecture.